Hi, everyone. I'm back with some back to school podcast readings um, on this Labor Day weekend. Uh, and there's nobody out there yet, <laughs> but I'm going to do this for when you're back from the beach or your cookout or what have you. You can sort of get a sense of where I was um, five years ago. Uh, so the first podcast episode I did, I revisited my very first blog post, which was about uh, questions that parents should be asking about the technology in their kids' schools. And I wrote it in the fall of 2016. And looking back, it seems really naive because right like now school is almost all online and that's sort of how, how it goes. Yeah. Um, and so rather than just going sort of plotting through chronologically, I was going to sort of pick one that jumped out at me uh, based on some things that have happened recently. And so the one I'm going to read, I actually wrote in January of 2017. And it really had a big influence on me because it was called, how exactly did the Department of Defense end up in my child's classroom? <laughs> and, you know, I think it's really relevant because a lot of the conversations about what's happening in classrooms and who's in control of the curriculum or not in control and what's happening, um, those are unfolding along sort of profoundly ideological, like, and politicized and polarized conversations. But I don't see a whole lot of the conversation around educational technology and curriculum being centered on the fact that it's a military mind game and has been since the cloud-based computing in the 1990s, since distance learning started. And I remember when I came across this and I was like, wow, well, this actually makes a lot of sense. So there's there's two pieces that I want to read. One is about uh, the Defense Department and advanced distributed learning and IMS global badges. Um, and then the, the other piece is just a very short piece. It sort of touches on uh, the Dell Foundation and Snowden and the NSA and understanding it as... Uh, Sort of surveillance technology, and you know, if you've had a chance to listen to the, the, the presentation that Jason and Leo and I did a couple of days ago about parametric insurance, and that might sound like like a boring topic, <laughs> you know, who wants to listen to three hours about parametric insurance? Like, what is parametric insurance? But essentially, it's part of this cybernetic structure. It's part of this cybernetic control grid that's linking the satellites in space and then the drones to the sensor networks on the ground that will ultimately be linked with our digital identity and our digital twins. And it's all about risk assessment. It's all about real-time data and risk modeling. And all of the data that's feeding the risk modeling is being sent into the simulation, some of which is feeding social impact finance deals for hedge fund derivatives, and some of it's being used for other things, like other kinds of prediction markets. And um, Jason and I are going to talk a little bit. We did a podcast with a woman about mental health stuff and um, the mental health and sentiment analysis on both emotion recognition in, in faces um, and textual analysis is that's a really part of risk profiling in those markets too. And those, those are coming into the schools because, you know, all of the, the ways in which they profess to care about children and have trauma-informed care and care about mental health. It's really a, a giant um, data grab of children through these technological systems to feed all of these things. But so, we, you know, we did this long talk about parametric insurance and blockchain and sort of hitting certain thresholds and payouts. And a lot of the infrastructure is very, very uh, cohesive with the kinds of technologies that are happening in schools with uh, data analytics, data dashboards, one-to-one -one devices, soon will be wearables and VR headsets and augmented reality and simulations, all of it gamed, all of it gamed, and that's all about the risk. And um, so it's risk modeling simulation. So all the stuff you hear about like school kids, data, uh, filling the gaps, uh, uh, addressing discrepancies, all of this, it's it's all like real-time risk analysis. Um, so that's, that's going on. And Sorry, honey, could you get that? I'm doing my thing. Sorry, <laughs> delivery, coffee delivery. Um, so yeah, I, th I think it's the coffee. <laughs> um, so yeah, risk analysis, and they tell you that it's about closing achievement gaps and helping the most vulnerable students and all of that. But ultimately, it's it's gaming, and it's this it's this risk gaming analysis that's increasingly going to be run from outer space on sensor networks that we don't have much control over. Um, so I think it's really useful to go back and look at this article from 2017. Um, Leo actually was in the library in Vermont, and he's like, hey, I'm looking, I was looking up some, I pulled a book off the shelf, 
And it was about sort of weather simulation modeling because some of the disasters we were talking about were weather related. And he's like, yeah, one of the first weather forecast modeling guys was in, in England. I'm thinking, I'm trying to remember his name, Lewis Fry Richardson, I think. And he was Quaker because I'm always talking about the Quakers. And so this is in the early 20th century and he was a pacifist. And so he was modeling weather um, weather systems. And then he found out that they were using the modeling of his weather systems for chemical warfare in the First World War. And so as a pacifist, he stopped that. But then he started modeling uh, warfare, like like modeling uh, uh, sociopolitical uh, cor deadly corals is what he was he was talking about it. So essentially, he played a major role in the Cold War in terms of like risk modeling for uh, international policy and politics and, and war under the pretense of peace. But where we've gotten to now is we've zoomed all the way over to the other side. And we're talking about like a cybernetic piece, right? A piece that is imposed through a totalitarian architecture that's like the uh, Yevgeny Zamyatin's book, We, right? Like you're peaceful, but you pretty much have no autonomy and no agency and no free will. And then everything is just flatlined. So, so we have the modeling and simulations. It relates to the education. It relates to modeling, creating cognitive architectures of your mind. And within all of the risk analysis, one of my other colleagues that we collaborate with um, another really creative thinker is my friend Steffers. And um, so she was just telling me about these things called Voroni patterns, V-O-R-O-N-O-I, Voroni. And it, it, they were, I think they're sort of ancient, but they, they were more popularized in the mid 19th century by a Ukrainian mathematician called Georgi Voron, Voroni with a Y. And he was working at... Um, he was working on essentially became tessellations. And so it was looking at natural systems and connections of pro points in proximity. And so these Voroni patterns are in nature in things like um, the patterns you see on a python um, in the in the skin, the, the sort of irregular how it's all put together, uh, the patterns of white on the brown fur of the giraffe. Uh, the, the patterns in a dragonfly's wing. And so there are all of these emergent patterns that are now being modeled mathematically and they're being used in many different ways from modeling um, risk of disease. Um, they're used for like contagion transmission, predictive analytics. Uh, they're used a lot in artificial vision of using these seed points to make predictions about what's next in the field. Um, and they're being used for bio-inspired materials, like these three-dimensional materials that are really like the matrix, really like this webbed matrix. So they're, they're, they're learning from nature, but then they're applying it in these new contexts. And so the, the, the patterns can both be physical um, in terms of like, if you printed it out or you drew it on a page, I think some of those, um, uh, you know, mindfulness coloring books, like tessellations, like we just sort of zone out and you color in all the little colors. Um, these tessellations are out there, but they're using them to, for the simulations. And, for risk profiling for these insurance deals. And of course the insurance deals are all running into the machine learning stuff, right? So they're they're risking, they're using it as an excuse to remake the world as a sensor network and then they're feeding the data to the AI. And so I found a, uh, oh gosh, let me see. The, uh, it is a, uh, it was an AI, it was a essentially a risk, a disaster risk management gathering uh, from 2018. And, it was about 160 page white paper. And one of the articles in it was called Resilience Dialogue, Artificial Intelligence in Disaster Risk Management. Could AI transform disaster risk management? And, um, and so that's part of this like grand gathering in 2018 about risk management and insurance. But the people who wrote this part of the paper about AI and risk management included the following people that contributed to the session. Uh, Fabio Pitaluga of the World Bank, because they're very interested in risk modeling for financial reasons. Uh, Nell Watson of Singularity University, right? Because all of the data is going towards the singularity. Uh, Ahmad Wani of One Concern. And I'm not sure what One Concern is. I need to look it up. Uh, Melanie Warwick of Google. Stephen Winchell of the U.S. Intelligence Advanced Research Projects Agency. So that's IARPA. 
and then Shri Kamal Kishore of the Indian National Disaster Management Authority, right? So, um, so you've got some pretty heavy players in this space on using AI to do risk modeling. And, and fully in this space, they're talking about using these Veroni patterns to do the risk analysis and simulation. And so there's a footnote at the end of the article that these guys were writing, and it says, recently, the entire United States was mapped by machine learning algorithms that processed nearly 200 million aerial images in just over 10 minutes. Okay, so this is US intelligence, Google, the World Bank, and Singularity, and also India, because you know India is clearly a big part of this too. And, um, and uh, so they're saying, they're telling you that from satellites, they can rebuild and remake and reanalyze the world like every 10 minutes if they wanted to and do the risk analysis. And what I'm trying to say is that the devices that that we're dealing with <clears throat> in educational technology space are military tools. And just as they can use satellite imagery to zoom in and like make like strategic decision making, make strategic decisions around war, economic policy, contagion policy, all of these things, all of those similar data streams are coming off the devices that are used not only in K-12 education or higher education, but also in training. Because moving forward, we're going to be on the ledger. The, the intention is that we live our life on the ledger, and that is the blockchain. So um, what I'm trying to say is the Veroni tessellations, I see someone here who's talking about like working on homeschooling. Like, but the thing is, you're probably like when I talk about the satellite imagery, like when you go out your house or you don't go out of your house, like the satellites know. So the reality is, is none of us are actually out of it, out of it. And then ultimately, the goal is, is to push the blockchain. The, the intention was always to dismantle public schools and then to push it into the community because that they can do better risk profiling when they're doing sensor network analysis in community. Right. So the whole um model is they really want an unschooling homeschooling model, but they want it attached with common data analytic standards that they can use to pit people off against one another for like global telepresence labor. And then um, they, they want you moving through the city uh, with your blockchain voucher payment systems and your digital identity so that they can create more robust risk models of, of, of if you, your kids, you know, every everyone is learners and workers because we're learning and we're working and it's all to feed it into the singularity. So, um, yeah, so that's sort of the, the, the framework. Words of the day, uh, Veroni patterns, check those out. Like if you want to, you know, drop a link in the comments or something later about like your favorite Veroni pattern. Because <laughs> um, I think that's really interesting too that one of the main uh, code coding programs is called Python. <laughs> And, you know, Python is is it, the skin of the natural Python is a Veroni pattern. Right. Um, and this is being used a lot in the in the virtual reality modeling simulations. Um, but, yeah, so so Veroni patterns and uh, risk assessment and prediction markets and sentiment analysis, because that's what this is. So I'm going to be just doing a reread on this, maybe taking a break and making some commentary. But this is five years old. And like how much I didn't know then, like I had no understanding of how much I didn't know at the time, but the learning curve, like until someone sort of slaps you on the face and says, wakey, wakey, like if this is something you need to pay attention to, then you're not going to know it because you're just going to sort of be drifting <clears throat> along in their dream. So, <clears throat> okay. So this is uh, January 16th, 2017. How did the Department of Defense end up in my child's classroom? So you cannot fully understand what is happening with future ready school redesign. And that's a concept they call. You can look up future ready schools. One-to-one uh, -one device program. So that's all the, you know, everybody have your own device, whether it's a tablet or a Chromebook or a laptop. And that's what we saw rolling out, you know, during the lockdowns when we, everybody got sent home. Embedded assessments. And this means data that's being collected in some sort of strategic way, but sometimes covertly, and sometimes they're behavioral. So sometimes you don't even know. Uh, gamification, which we've called, we've talked about before, um, that this is all gamified, and classroom management. And those are the classroom economies, the classroom token economies. Um, and the push for students in neighborhood schools to supplement their instruction with online courses. So you can't understand why any of that's happening until you understand the role of the federal government and the Defense Department, the, the role that they have specifically played in bringing us to where we are today. OK, so uh, in 1999, all right, so we're 
back in the day, um, just as cloud-based computing was coming on the scene, President Bill Clinton signed something called Executive Order 13111. And he created something called the Advanced Distributed Learning Initiative, or ADL. Uh, Section 5 of this executive order set up the Advisory Committee on Expanding Training Opportunities. Now, we can see now how this is going to be very closely linked with the, you know, the Build Back Better and the Build the Metaverse is that expanded training. And it was some of it was for the military um, and then some of it was for civil service. And eventually the goal was to have it for everyone. Um, OK, so uh, the Advisory Committee on Expanding Training Opportunities to advise the president on what should be done to make technology based education a reality for the entire country. Emphasize entire. The intent was not only to prioritize technology for quote unquote like lifelong learning, but also to shift the focus to developing human capital and in doing so bind education to the needs of industry and the economy. And so it's really important for people who are like caught in sort of the polarized ideological framework. Um, I've had many people, and I know that Charlotte Iserbet was a leader and a pioneer in this space and did a lot of really great documentation. I would say I, I diverge from her position in that I think she imagined that we had been infiltrated and that this was all coming from the outside to remake education into something that was more socialist or communist or whatever. Um, what I saw when I was looking into Mark Tucker and the National Center on Education and the Economy was that this was run by the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. Like this, the, this was run at the highest levels by business interests. So yeah, they wanted an engineered economy, but it wasn't that they wanted an engineered economy because they were looking for to uphold the rights of workers or equal opportunities or anything like that. They wanted a planned economy so that they could make sure that they had enough human capital plus extra to pay like less than they needed um, towards this new plan. Now, when I wrote this, I wasn't clued in about remote robotic labor. So I didn't fully understand that the new the new program was going to be everyone in the world competing against everyone else. And, and most of you know, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce is really not the United States anymore. It's these are multinational corporations whose interests are all around the world. Right. So so they're building up their human capital base uh, for this next phase, which is is to build the, build virtual reality. And, and that's what it's about. And so it's it's very much. Both sides, I think, are right in that you have to have concerns about the government because the government is the access conduit to the human capital. Like the, the government is providing access to private capital through your digital identity and through the government services, whether that be education schools, public schools, or a choice voucher for your cho choice of schools, um, or whether that's food assistance or housing assistance or all those things, like the government is what's going to make that possible. But the people who really need to run their capital through your body are these hedge funds, right? And so that's the key piece. It's both parts. It's the government and private industry. And, and increasingly, these private industries, they're not really people. <laughs> like, I feel like you know, we're moving into this territory of decentralized autonomous organizations where, you know, we've already seen like companies having the rights of citizens, but soon this, this idea of the company having these rights as a citizen, it's not even alive. Literally, it's a system of code. It's a, it's a coded structure. And so when I'm talking about the, these Veroni patterns of the matrix, um, it's taking a natural supportive architecture of the universe and then perverting it into this open air, like, prison matrix program. Um, so, but the public private partnership is central. And I would say, you know, there still are many people who imagine that it came out and I'm saying, well, if essentially the entire U S government and all of the nonprofits and all the academic institutions and all of the companies have accepted it. I don't think you can really say that it infiltrated us. Like it, at this point, it is us that, that, that is what we have agreed to. And it didn't happen overnight. It's happened at least, um, I mean, probably most of the 20th century, like we've gradually agreed to it. So um, that's where I stand. I know it's sort of in, in it did that point differs from a lot of other people out there and how they talk about it. OK, so they need the planned economy and that's coming through the advanced distributed learning and that's coming through the badges and it's coming through something called ONET, with it, which is the Department of Labor in Raleigh, North Carolina, that was connected with NC State. OK, so representatives of Cisco Systems and Jobs for the Future, which is largely bankrolled by the Gates Foundation, among others, um, they OK, so they they were the co-chairs. So others others around the table included uh, the e-learning industry, 
student loan financiers, educational testing companies, human resource managers, labor market analysts, universities, community colleges, chambers of commerce, city government, and a futurist. So these are the people who 20 years ago were planning out what we're living through right now. And they knew it was coming. They knew the blockchain was coming. You know, Scott Stronat over at Bell Labs, they had that all set up. They knew about the payment systems. Like this, this was, so like, I could just keep thinking these people must be really good actors or just really good at deluding themselves about things. Um, okay, so the futurist. And so George Bush, so it's both sides. So Clinton gets it started, then it has the handoff to Bush. So George Bush incorporated Clinton's work into his own executive order, uh, 13218, which was called the 21st Century Workforce Initiative. And then the following year, the effort got bipartisan stamp of approval. And then the Obama administration continued the push for online learning in his national broadband plan. And that had an entire section on digital education uh, as the, the centerpiece of 21st century school redesign and for connect ed and future ready schools and digital promise. And so I, I just want to reemphasize that all of this was done knowing that this was going to be blockchain, knowing that this was going to be distributed in nodes and decentralized with the understanding that they are going to be taking schools apart because there's more value in the data economy to take schools apart and send everybody off as individual learning agents that they can be tracked through their activities than to keep 33 kids in a public school classroom. So the, 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 it was always the plan to disassemble everything. And so, you know, I know within the traditional homeschooling community and unschooling community, there's sort of a bifurcation of people who are still committed to like, books at the kitchen table and this. But what I'm saying is all of the public resources that we people used to use, like go to the library, go to community, you know, uh, you know, anything that you would go to as a normal, like traditional homeschool student, as soon as they take a digital voucher, that's going to be co-opted into this whole cybernetic system. And they're going to be guided by whatever like replaces common core state standards and the digital badges for the social emotional learning and, you know, your knowledges and your skills. Um, and I, I don't see enough organize, organization within the homeschool. Like, even if you think that you're going to be able to do it your own way, and maybe you're even going to fund your own alternative community-based infrastructure that is not going to take that money, like ultimately you're living in the satellite world. And so when I was just talking about the whole global risk analysis industry with Google and Singularity and the Defense Department and IARPA, um, as soon as you go out of your door and even probably, I mean, they've got stuff that they could probably, you know, do heat sensing and know where you are in your house. You're not really out of it. So we actually have to like unite <laughs> and actually say that we don't want to live in the these uh, Veroni pattern web systems that are of, of sense, you know, ubiquitous computing sensing. Like we have to actually get to that point that we can do that all together. Um, and because that's the thing we have to say no to. And if we actually can put that to bed, then like we can talk about being civil to one another about each other's choices and making sure that everybody has enough resources to do what they find is their a preferred choice for their family and their children. But until we can get the web the web three stuff straightened out. Like it, we're not, we're not anything we do. They're just going to be le leading us into a, a, a vortex that we'll never get out of and keep us busy until this thing locks in. And I feel like it's going to lock in pretty soon. Okay. So advanced distributed learning ADL began as an electronic classroom for the national guard. Okay. And it, it later expanded to serve the entire defense department. So in 1998, the government decided to use all federal, use it for all federal employee training. And by leveraging its influence over federal contracting, the government successfully pushed for standards that enabled wide adoption of cloud-based instructional technology. So yeah, so the government got it started. It, it, it was embedded again within defense. You know, and I've said this before, I feel like this is, it's an imperial project, guys. This is a global imperial project. The new empire is the metaverse. They want to build it. Um, they don't want you to think too hard about it. So they, it actually does need to be within sort of a chain of command infrastructure. And I've talked about that, that there's different, a different protocol of training someone to follow chain of command and have sufficient information and skill to deploy their limited part of the program in an appropriate, timely way to accomplish a larger strategic objective. And 
educating someone to contest possibly that trajectory entirely. <laughs> Those are very different things. So to have the educational technology space coming directly out of the military is meaningful and it, it ties into the imperial project aspect. Okay, uh, so, and, and they need it unified, right? Because they need for the kids in the Philippines to compete against the kids in Kenya, to compete against the kids in, in Newark, New Jersey, right? It has to be unified. If you don't have a comprehensive system of encoding uh, so that they know what the badges mean and it's interoperable and the AI can sort it out because the AI can't tolerate uncertainty. It needs everything just so. Every Life has to be narrowed down into just those categories that the AI can use to sort and rank labor. And, and that's, that's why the UN and the World Economic Forum and the Impact Management Project and the World Bank and the IMF are so central into deploying global ed tech and, 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 and really essentially bumping up um, like Africa and India because they really want to get all those kids online to code the metaverse. Okay. Um, all right. So, all right. So as the Department of Defense worked on e-learning for the military in the mid-1990s, so this is going on in the mid-90s, the Department of Education put together the first educational technology plan, and that was in 1996. A tremendous infusion of federal funds was released into schools to support technology purchases and expand internet access. And part of that was the E-rate program, and that was both in schools and libraries. All right, so 1996, like I have, and maybe I'll put in actually a link when I'm done with this. I made a really long spreadsheet of the dates of all of these things because it's really helpful to see the chronology of how things happen and where they play out. So the, the federal government says we're doing distance learning and then they frame it as an access opportunity, right? Like we have to make sure everybody has equal access. So we're going to underwrite expansion of broadband into schools uh, through and libraries through E-rate. And that was the connectivity. But then within that that framework, Apple like wandered in and said, well, it can't just be hardwired. It also has to be wireless. And so I do think that the entire wireless element of this was part of this um, low dose radiation program that they're talking about for like hormesis. I think they might say it like the low dose stress that this this um, the radiation that's coming off of all of these devices is supposed to be for the like uh, radio eugenics evolution project. And so even as they were doing E-rate, Apple came in and Apple was really central in getting a hold of the educational technology space. And they said, well, you need wireless too. And then of course the hardwired only you know, like having a school computer lab lasted for what, like maybe, you know, five to eight years. And then all of a sudden they came out with the dropping the price points on the individual community technologies. And then, and then everything had to go wireless. Um, so at the same time, an organization called IMS Global uh, began to advance implementation of this e-learning system. Now, it, this was a nonprofit that started out as a higher education trade group, and it now has over 150 contributing members, um, including IBM, Microsoft, Oracle, Pearson, and hundreds upon hundreds of affiliated companies and institutions that use its open source specifications. And again, open source is really important. And the Gates Foundation was a platinum level sponsor of four of their initiatives. So um, yeah, that's 150. That was in 2017. Like I dare you to go on IMS Global's website now and see like how many people that are connected to it, right? Um, a lot. And and it's pretty much like you can't do education without it. And, you know, I, I have someone that I know in the, the higher education space who said, and I'm just going to keep saying this over and over, that if you fall out of compliance with your health checkup, data dashboard login with whatever data proof of verification certification that you have, that what happens is that is linked to Canvas, which is your online education system. And then you're just like, poof, like, you know, you're just cut off. And if you're a professor, you're cut out. And if you're a student, you're cut out. And all of these systems are interlinked and automated. And there's like really no one to go to, to you know, to, to do anything about it. Like if you run into a problem or you have a disagreement or you say like, wait a minute, I uploaded that, but it didn't register or whatever. Like, you're just out of luck. So all of these systems, and you think like, this is a pretty, like, yeah, on the one hand, it's a long time horizon, but 96, 1996, that's not that long ago, right? To remake the world. And I think even, you know, my kid has been out of K-12 for, you know, three, four years now, but I can't even imagine the changes that have happened under lockdown and, and, and like that you probably can't even do education in a, in a, in a, in a government funded school without a device at this point, like an individual device. Um, okay. 
So, do, 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 do. Uh, so IMS Global, yes. So over 20 years, IMS Global's members shared research and resources. Is they build up an industry now valued at $255 billion annually. And so if you wonder why they won't give education back to human teachers, you simply need to take a close look at the many politically connected interests that are counting on digital education being the new paradigm. <laughs> so yeah, like all the teachers would say, it doesn't make sense. Why are you doing this stuff? So it doesn't make sense. Well, it makes sense in the data economy. It makes sense in the new imperial framework. It makes sense because someone has to build the metaverse. People have to be conditioned to accept it. We have to like roll into this totalitarianism and they need the teachers to do it. And so in some ways, just as like the education system pulled children off the land and put them in factories and then, you know, went from factories to cubicles and now cubicles to haptic suits, like that's, that's, that's the direction. And the teachers are tapped to do that. And I think increasingly we have this cognitive dissonance of you're asking me to do something that's really harmful and terrible and doesn't actually speak to our humanity in any way, but it's happening because it's an economic construct. It's not happening because China wants to come in the back door and convert us all to communism. That's not why it's happening. It's happening because literally we're building this empire and the empire is built on data. And so all of the children become the digital commodities. So IMS Global and Advanced Distributed Learning teamed up to establish common standards for metadata and content packaging of so-called learning objects. So that's the stuff you're dealing with. In a world of 21st century education reform, ed, sorry, in a world of 21st century education, reformers anticipate that school will be largely about children interacting with online learning objects. They call this a playlist education, where based on your past performance, algorithms will serve up what they think you need to know next. For people like Reed Hastings, Jeff Bezos, and Mark Zuckerberg, such an education where students consume predetermined content seems the ultimate inefficiency. Gamified experiences and online simulations being developed through ADL and DARPA in partnership with many universities and nonprofits will also provide a structure to capture students' soft skills and shape their behavior. Okay, so yeah, it's a learning object. And I would say one of the, the entities people are not haven't don't really talk a lot about is Hewlett Packard and the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation. They both set up impact philanthropy. So they remade the nonprofit space for social impact and data. And then they also worked on what's called open education resources or OER. And there's, there's a really classic video with this guy from Newton where he's presenting, I think in 2012, about uh, to at the US Department of Education in Washington talking about how currently education is the most data mineable um, place in the economy, like until they get nanobots in our bodies and then maybe it'll become health. But for right now, education is the most data mineable piece. And depending on how you interact with different modules of instruction, which is like, think about it. It's all the TED Talks, the Discovery Channels, the uh, like uh, 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 George Lucas, Edutopia, all of the bits and pieces of online content, they want you entrained with it. They want to look at you. They want the camera. They want to see how you respond to feed you the next thing, to nudge you in the direction and then nudge you back and to make you their puppet. And, and then they, they want to do it over and over again and keep recycling you as these in, impact commodities. So, um, so that is really important to understand open education resources. And then now they're creating virtual reality open education resources. So they're going to like actually have those modules in a headset or in augmented reality glasses so that they can capture even more behavioral data. Okay. Um, and they want the soft skills. So that's why they want the out of school time learning is so that you get together and do quote unquote fun things with friends or hands on learning or work based learning. And they can track you that way to get that part of your identity captured as well for the digital twinning. Um, okay, so the first product ADL and IMS Global came up with was called SCORM or Shared Content Object Reference Model. I think model. I thought it was maybe module. It's either model or module. SCORM. SCORM provided pathways for the bits and pieces of e-learning content to get to a particular learning management system like Dreambox. And that was accessed by a certain student. So it tracked elements like course completion, pages viewed, and test scores. So SCORM was the first thing. And it only could live mostly on a laptop. And what it did was it matched you. It said, okay, so here's an object, a conditioning, an entrainment object. 
of knowledge, a module where if you do a module, you're not supposed to have a co cohesive look, like the kind of brain that, that I'm wrangling now that I have that was trained in real books and, and creative story writing and art history and symbols and like synthetic thinking. They don't want that. They just want, here's a bit, here's a bit, drip, 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 be what we want you to be, drip, 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 drip. You, you're not allowed to get out of the drip. Like they decide the drip. And as they build you, they build the cognitive model of your mind, which is, is going to be fed to the singularity machine. Um, so, th but those initial ones of SCORM would only work on a laptop, which was, that's all there really was in the late 1990s, that there, there was only like, if you, desktops and laptops. And so the traditional learning devices, uh, programs like Dreambox, Achieve 3000, those were primarily on regular computing systems and they worked for SCORM. Um, uh, okay, so, but by 2008, there was a desire to track a student's interaction with devices outside of a fixed learning management system. And new devices and games didn't work within the SCORM framework. So ed tech proponents, they wanted the students to be able to interact with online content in new ways so they could record interactions taking place on mobile platforms directly through browser searches or Internet of Things sensors. So you, you imagine, um, you know, our digital footprint that's left and, you know, these social media exchanges where, um, you know, you might look in your profile and it has ca you categorized as certain things and it may or may not be at all close to what you actually are, but based on how you interact, it's making predictions. And so that's the level of granularity that they needed that wasn't working for the SCORM. And, and it wasn't going to work on a phone and it wasn't, um, uh, it, it, like it wouldn't work on a phone or a tablet or a wearable or a VR. So the next thing they needed was to work with all of that stuff and, and the games. It didn't work with the games. And increasingly, education is going to be a game. And, you know, Bill Gates and Michael Curl at Arizona State and in QTEL, you know, they, they've devised that the new version of education is going to be that you you play a game. You play it is is like transmedia storytelling that you enter into you inhabit a gaming simulation. And as you learn in the game and eventually when you've completed all the quests, then you will be at the end and you will graduate. And that is all of these like competency badges is, is mixing up transmedia storytelling and gamification with the idea that they can process you within their their systems, their cybernetic systems to turn you into like the human capital that they want you to be. Um, okay, so ADL commissioned a new specification that could track activity streams as students interacted with online media. And this result was something called XAPI or Tin Can API, which is an interesting concept actually. Like I was just talking with my friend Steffers, we were talking and Jason, like we, we had a can of worms on our last thing, like the can of worms. So what is in the tin can, right? Um, and it debuted in 2011. So that's not really all that long ago. That's just a decade. So now all sorts of data can be monitored, tracked and put into your data locker. And that's going to be your digital twin. Um, uh, doo -doo 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 -doo. Sorry, I'm, I'm distracting myself. Uh, yeah, so learning record stores. Learning record stores or an LRS, that's your digital twin. That's going to be your mastery transcript. That's going to be your comp set of competency badges, your lifelong ledger. So LRSs can store information about the videos you watched, the online quizzes you took, what the results were, what websites you went to, what books you bought, what games you played, what articles you read, what your annotations were, and it can get data captured by sensors, RFID chips, and biometric monitors. So LRSs collect data about all sorts of informal learning experiences. And so like, I mean, chime in if you guys understand like what I'm talking about with this data capture and how it relates to unschooling and homeschooling and, and blockchain vouchers. I mean, I'm hoping that you can see that because they want dynamic participation. Like they wouldn't love anything better than to have all people leave public schools immediately and proceed to the online LARPing digital gaming program where, you know, like Leo and I had talked about this going into the forest and doing, you know, Oracle games and connecting with nature and whatever, and like put on your sensing capes and, you know, do these rituals and, and like, the kids would probably love it because they would think that they're just doing like D and D or something like that. And, and the parents would probably love it because the kids love it. And then, but what the heck is really going on? Because all of this is military mind control, 
<laughs> technology, right? That we don't control. And so they want people to want this. They want to make the existing system. And I, again, everybody has their own thing. Like I came in as a public school graduate who did well in that system to a point until I understood better what it was and my kid did. And I was trying to hold that up. But that was always meant to come undone into the new model. And we, we need for the people who are doing the new model to think, like, even if you try and like, for, by all means, try to protect your kids as much as possible. Like, try to keep them out of it. Try to, as they get older, like, you know, don't scare them to death. I think that was my problem with my kid is that my work overwhelmed them and made them run away from me. But try to, you know, as best you can support them in their understanding so that they can make informed choices and see the layers behind the layers because you're not supposed to see the man behind the curtain. Okay. Um, okay. So, Okay. So, uh, okay. So, so the, you've got the new specifications. The MacArthur Foundation has been funding this. All right. Uh, in digital media and learning, they have a whole program uh, that they funded for like 10 years about essentially with something called frameworks, uh, which is a social science, behavioral science analytics group. And what they would do is they did all these focal groups and then they would figure out what, where people were and where they wanted them to be in terms of accepting this new model, and then how to gradually move them over. And they had all sorts of things. They had reports, they had videos, they had cartoons, they had letters to the editor, they had scripts, they had things say, that would say, okay, this is what parents are going to say when they push back. It's going to be this, but when they say this, you say this, but you don't ever say that. And so they have them exactly pulling along. And the thing about the MacArthur Foundation, and this is what's dawning on me now so clearly with like understanding the work that we were doing, like in understanding radio ecology and tracking energy exchange systems and ecosystems, right? And the place of people in living environments, risk analysis and simulation modeling. And that the fact that these parametric insurance programs are going to be embedded, the insurance industry and the reinsurance industry is huge. And guess who MacArthur found, like, guess where the MacArthur Foundation money is? It was insurance money. It was insurance money in the 50s. Um, it, they were one of the largest insurance companies back in the 50s. And um, you don't look like, I mean, it's, it's logical. Like once you can zoom out and get the entire thing, it's like, click, 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 everything falls into place. Of course, the insurers want to control the delivery of the labor force, the economic modeling, the mind control. Um, of course, they will tell it's for, you know, to optimize employment and to provide world peace and to uplift mental health. But really, it is like turning your agency over to a mechanized militarized control system run by um, algorithms and, you know, and there's money involved. These insurance aren't in, my, companies aren't in it to not make money. <laughs> like they're totally in it to make money. So, um, so the MacArthur's involvement in all of this. And then, you know, on the other hand, Hewlett Packard is the tech behind it in the, 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 the the biometrics. Um, it's very logical. It's really very logical. And the amount of money they can throw at it to tell you, to convince people that this is okay, to convince people that this is not only okay, like, you're a terrible person if you don't want this to the most the, the least advantaged people in the country. You're a terrible person if you don't want to close the digital divide. How dare you exclude people from the new empire, right? Because everybody should have an equal opportunity to live in this em empire that we've built. Um, only we're not going to tell you that it's a game and that the game it's not your game. Um, so, okay. So let me go back to the article. Um, Okay. With the development of XAPI, the Ed Reform 2.0 vision of any time, quote unquote, any place learning uh, where human teachers and school buildings are no longer required could happen more quickly. So IMS Global is now supporting Mozilla's Open Badge initi Initiative. So these are the badges. Um, and XAPI metadata could eventually be combined with badges, these badge programs, and the blockchain Bitcoin stuff to create electronic portfolios, which are online credential systems. So at the time I was writing this, we, they hadn't gotten to, they hadn't gotten to the point of doing the blockchain transcripts, but they, they're, they're well there along the way now in digital identity. Um, and, and if automatic credential verification and micropayments come to fruition, a virtual wallet voucher system could devastate already precarious public education funding. 
Now, when I was writing this then, I was writing it as a public school advocate, but clearly once they get the, the blockchain vouchers out into the broader ecosystem, then that's a poison that's running through the entire system. And, and, and that's why I think we actually all have to stand together on, on this. And we have to like get to a point that we can respect each other's choices and that we can all have empathy and caring for um, each other's children. And then also for children that don't have you know, whose, whose families are either not intact or so under besieged that they, they're, they're not capable of being strong advocates for them. Like there's a lot of kids that don't have someone advocating for them either in their immediate family or in their community. And we need to not throw those kids under the bus either. Um, literally. Okay. So with, uh, uh, so the Advanced Distributed Learning Initiative is a major player in the development of mobile game-based and virtual learning environments. They also conduct extensive research and development on online personal learning assistance and with the aim of creating digital tutors for all of us. Their research is carried out at four cooperative labs or co-labs, and they are located in Madison, Wisconsin, Alexandria, Virginia, Memphis, Tennessee, and Orlando, Florida. And each lab supports partnerships with private sector interests and institutions. Okay. So, um, so this is part of lifelong learning of the four collabs. Uh, Orlando is the military one. And most of this, a lot of the simulation training and modeling is based on um, military gaming. And it, and it makes sense. And I've written about this before, but th there is a need for, the military and like increasingly, I don't think war, like we're already kind of in war right now. It's an information war and we don't understand it as war because it looks different, but um, the modeling and the simulations are always key in, in terms of military engagements uh, where people physically go into places or also have to model uh, a cultural relationships in, in, um, in different geographic settings, all right? They use these these games to both model uh, sociocultural training, and then they also, in terms of strategy. So, you know, they drop you into the, you know, raid the compound, you know, 30 times until you get it right. And that's part of the gaming. And, and that's where the gaming things come. It's not just, you know, these um, war games <laughs> didn't just come to be games. They came out of the war machine. And that's, and so that Orlando was really central to that piece. And again, no surprise, close to Disney, close to the space close coast. There's a lot of virtual reality um, and stuff. Florida is a really an epicenter. And that's why I tell people there's, there's a lot of folks who are, you know, imagining because they, they, they buy into the polarity that there's going to be some savior there and that you can run to some safe place. But the thing is that they're working all the angles like Florida is not in no way safe. And MacArthur is very deeply embedded there and the military and the simulation industry. So yeah, a lot of stuff in, in there. Um, Madison, Madison, Wisconsin was the K-12 education and gaming. So this woman, uh, I'm trying to remember her name. I'm going to say constant Stein cooler. Constance Steinschooler and her husband were all about the gaming. They eventually moved over to UC Irvine, uh, but they were, it, and some of these things were also psychological games. And so, so that was the K-12 space was Madison, Wisconsin. And then Memphis um, was the workforce development again. So that's the lifelong learning. So you're never actually getting out of the game. And I've used a video a lot and you can check the playlist on, um, like on, on, on this channel, like afterwards, I have a playlist that is about education and it's like 50 clips. Now, most of these clips are just two minutes. So you could like work your way through progressively and see where my thinking is on this. And I actually developed it for someone who, you know, is in meetings on ed tech and blockchain with the World Bank. And I said, this is like, you know, they're not, they're in these fancy meetings, but they don't know all the stuff. So I'm like, this is all the stuff. So one of the, the videos in there is called uh, Life on the Ledger, or Learning is Earning. And, you know, it talks about like, yeah, an Amazon driver listening to audiobooks and getting blockchain tokens, um, because he's like, someday I'm not going to be a driver anymore. I'm going to do things. And so, but meanwhile, they're mining him for his compliance through the audiobooks and the entrainment in his vehicle. Okay, uh, so those are the, oh, in Alexandria, Virginia, like no surprise, surprise, that's the admin center, but that's the center for all the intelligence community stuff. Um, okay, so the Wisconsin Collab works specifically on academic projects, many involving Florida Virtual School with whom they have a longstanding partnership. Uh, the Collab's focus is on competency-based education. So 
you know, when I was doing this in 2017, there were not a lot of people talking about competency-based education, but that's really coming out a lot now. So they've partnered with the Educational Psychology Department at uh, University of Wisconsin-Madison for gaming platforms, and they maintain 60 partnerships uh, researching and refining game-based online instruction. Another focus has been developing MASLO, Maslow, or Mobile Access to Supplemental Learning Objects, which is enabled by XAPI. So that's going to be the augmented reality stuff. Um, and uh, the Tennessee CoLab has been doing research on intelligent tutoring uh, that even recognizes human emotion in the person using a given device and tries to counteract negative emotion. And so if I have time, like when I'm done with this, I'm going to read a section out of, I keep talking about the Diamond Age book, but this is really useful and important, Neil Stevenson, because see that the, the picture on the cover, that was the intelligent tutor. And he wrote this in 1995. He wrote this in 1995. They were like the, the first ed tech plan was in 1996. And he, and this tutor is, is a human, live human tutor coming, accessing the poor little girl halfway around the world through an iPad way before we knew that iPads came out, okay? So they knew and they knew this plan. And essentially, in this case, the human tutor through the iPad was actually what they call a racked or a, a real person who was an actress. But soon it's just going to be AI. And as you're interacting with your personal assistant, it's building the cognitive model of you. Okay. Uh, so DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, is also in the business of developing gaming simulations and intelligent tutoring systems. They work closely with the Office of the Navy. Their ENGAGE program was set up in 2012, and through partnerships with Carnegie Mellon, Texas A&M, UCLA, and the University of Denver, they created many games for K-12 students based on alternate reality teaching. Right? Get you in... <laughs> alternate realities, our quote unquote, our space in virtual environments, instruction in social emotional learning was built into those games. So they're mind games. They are literally mind games. Their quote unquote, full spectrum learning program aims to create an online platform that can monitor students and identify their strengths and weaknesses and revise the experience adaptively based on the data generated. And like, once you understand the empire, like you can imagine where this is all going, right? With with the online learning and the lockdowns, like this stuff is going to keep coming back. They're going to keep sending kids back home, back home, be with the device because the device needs to learn you for the system. Um, the arrival, sorry, the arrival of ADL cha uh, changed public education in a very fundamental way. It is no coincidence that the destructive No Child Left Behind Act was signed into law the year after it was created. Over the next 15 years, with bipartisan support, education incrementally gave way to training creativity to compliance, serendipity to standards, and human connection to digital isolation. Right? I wrote I, I wrote wrote this in 2017, right? Digital isolation. Think about how isolated people were on these devices. I'm just ahead of the curve, guys. As the curriculum became narrower and narrower, emphasizing standardized test scores and demonstrations of skills, education became a hollowed out exercise, something that could be digitized and outsourced to corporations. Data-driven standards-based tactics have been intentionally employed to re regiment the very human process of teaching and learning. During ADL's first decade, the imperative was to get technology and internet into schools. And once that infrastructure was in place, they could concentrate on restructuring the curriculum, making screen-based education central, and pushing the teacher into a secondary role on the sidelines. Common Core state standards were a big part of that process. The National Governors Association and the Council of Chief State School Officers created those standards in 2009. And not as many people know about the common education data standards that were established around the same time. SEDS, C-E-D-S, C-E-D-S, enabled the collection and sharing of vast amounts of data across sectors from pre-K through community college. And so I'm just asking you to understand the simulations and the sentiment analysis and the risk profiling that's going to be happening through the insurances companies, but like the risk, the risk analysis and the, the cybernetic, like the homeostasis and the pushback and the balancing and the redistributing of the system and the systems like engineering and these neural networks and the blockchain. Um, 
it's it's totalitarian. I mean, my friend Jan just posted a thing on our discourse about totalitarianism and Hannah Arendt, and it's it's pervasive. It's all pervasive. You, you can, now. I'm sorry if you're saying homeschool. You haven't been listening to my talk, okay? I'm just I'm I'm really getting very frustrated. Maybe you came in late. Please go back and listen to it from the beginning. Homeschooling is not getting you out of the matrix, guys. It isn't. And even if you sit at your cable with just, okay, so please go back and listen to the beginning because this is important, all right? Even if you sit just with your most classic curriculum with paper books and pencils, you're going to go out of the door someday. And what I've said is the satellite communication systems, the risk communication systems, the threat communication systems are sweeping the world every 10 minutes, okay? So guess what? If there's no data flow coming from a house, they're going to send social services to your house and say, why is there no data coming out of your house? So like we actually have to find a way that we can integrate across without like, yeah, homeschool, homeschool for now. And I'm not saying like you can have your choice. I'm not saying not to have your choice, but to think that that's the end all answer is actually exactly where they want people because they want you to feel like you actually have a control over it. And like, I think we have a control in the field, not in the material, but we only have control to the extent of which we actually understand the game they've placed us in and that it isn't our game. And that even within the people who are absenting the game, that's part of the game too. So all of the layers are the game, <laughs> um, the game within the game within the game. And so there is a sense of like cohesion that we have to find within ourselves. Well, first we have to be very clear in our own hearts about what's happening about like being centered in a, like from a place of, of care for the world and not fear because we're here for purpose. Like I truly believe if we're seeing this, we're here because we are supposed to have a purpose and put our own imprint and our own energetic will onto this. And it's happening in the field, but we actually have to come. You know what? You, there's not, there, the answer is in the work. There's like, we, we've never lived through this. There's no manual, right? What they want is fragmentation and they want a distributed system that they can track. And once you understand like the extent to which literally, like when I was, when the lockdowns first happened and I knew how this was all unfolding again, I'm writing this in 2017. I don't know how they're going to do it. I don't know how. And, and I, it, health was not anything that was on my in my consciousness at that time, but clearly it needed to be global and that's how they did it. And so one of the Harvard Business School articles uh, with the head of Gabby was essentially saying, yeah, we have something called macro eyes and we're going to track, you know, uptake of the stuff that we're telling you, you have to uptake from satellites in Africa of children, like African villages. So if you, if you think just homeschooling in and of itself and that's where it stops, like then you don't actually understand the pervasiveness of the system. Harvard is bragging with Gabby that they can track from outer space people's health compliance. Um, that's intense, right? But the thing is, no one wants that. Like even I think people who work for reinsurance companies and people who are high level military wouldn't want that. But we actually have to awaken to that's what it is. And if and they're going to give you all sorts of little mini solutions so that you can feel like. Like, oh, okay, so this is my suit. I'm going to just do this and I'll be okay. No, because like you think you have a handle on education, but this is across everything. This is housing. This is food. This is, I mean, it, I mean, if you're following me, like you know how pervasive it is. So like we can't just target education. We actually, it's it's a control grid. Um, well, but the thing is then you're, I think people are not understanding the pervasiveness you're not understanding cyber physical systems. You're not understanding nanotechnology. You're not understanding frequency because what they're manipulating is beyond our sensory experience. I mean, they, they have the field, but we also have that innate connection to the field too. That's a not, that is the authentic. And so we, to, but we have to actually step into that space. And if we're dithering around simply in the primarily in the material, I think that's where they want to keep it all. So I don't have the answer. Like we have to work through it together. But I would say like, I don't even, you know, I would like to hear more people unpacking this material as opposed to retreading these very tired ideological polarizing tropes um, and missing the whole point, which is why I'm trying to bring back 
like the military aspect and the imperial aspect, because that's that's what it is. And it's something that's going to be then pivoted around into the entire distributed educational, not just K-12, not just higher ed, our whole life until we die. We will be learners with our personal assistant sitting on our shoulder, tracking everything to manage us and to, to, to try to shape how we see the world, try to shape the vision that we have, try to shape what we're listening to, to become its extensions. And we're not that, like we, we won't be that but we have to actually be attuned to it. So, okay, back to the article, um, Common Core. So the learning registry, the learning registry is another important piece of the puzzle. It was created in 2011 as a partnership between the U.S. Department of Education and the Department of Defense. So um, it's an open source distribu distribution network of learning resources that holds metadata and paradata. It is important to understand that learning objects can be tagged in many ways, including adding tags, for a variety of standards. For that reason, even we, if we get rid of common core standards, it wouldn't necessarily make a dent in slowing down this rollout. And so that's what I'm saying for the folks who have been following along. Like the conservatives were really good on common core. Unfortunately, they did sort of wander in and hold, like latch on to a lot of the ideological stuff that made it hard to have a broad base of support. But many of them were led to believe that like when common core stopped that they won, right? Because that they were supposed to put all of their energy into this thing that wasn't, was really just a straw man so that the, the whole thing happened. <laughs> and um, so, so, you know, I have to say as someone who comes from a more progressive left now politically homeless framework, like the conservatives were actually really spot on in many ways and ahead and actually very mobilized and very assertive, but they missed a big piece of the, 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 the puzzle. They didn't actually know where it was going and they allowed their buttons, their ideological buttons to be pushed um, in such a way that now they're like cheering on and asking people to all run to Florida, which is the center of the educational militarized educational technology space. So, um, so we just have to get like really clear about it. And then we have to like respect each other as individuals, like unique individuals with something to offer. And we have to actually like care about each other, not hate each other. Because I, I think inherently, like we, sh we should have the good parts. And, and I'll just say the learning registry with all the tags, right? So they're going to deliver up to you like a little, you know, video clip to teach you about quantum thermodynamics. And it's going to be all tagged with all these tags. And they'll say, oh, you know, like I can look up on, you know, YouTube who looked for how, like, not individually, but like, oh, how many people, like, you know, like my tail, because my stuff is always like three hours long. So it goes, okay, woo, boop, like nobody stays to the end, right? Like you can look at all of these analytics and they're using all, like they have way more analytics than we do. And, um, you know, and that relates to that whole thing of like, we are not files that they did before. Like we're not files. Like I know enough about these metadata tags. We're totally not about files. Don't make anybody a file. People aren't files. Stuff isn't file. Life is life. You learn stuff. It shouldn't be on a permanent record. It shouldn't be part of your cognitive model. Like you own, like not you own, but you are, you are a dynamic fluid waveform in this world, this cosmic, sacred cosmic universe, whatever your faith practice is. And you're not this thing that they want to tie up in a learning record store. You're simply not that. So, okay. So I think I'm getting close. So Paradata describes how online learning resources are used. Who is searching? What students are in the room? Right. So who's around you? Like, think about how all of that is um, working together. Right. Like who is near you? Think about the track and trace. And you're uh, you're consuming data because it's all going to be on a phone now. Right. So you don't even get a Chromebook. It's going to be on your phone. So you're consuming this data and people around you are consuming their data. And then they'll correlate all of that. Right. So, you know, that's important. Who's in the room? Uh History of searches conducted. What is being viewed, downloaded, and shared? Like how long did you spend on it? Where were your eyeballs? What were your emotions? Um, that's affectiva computing. Uh, to which standards are, is the content aligned? What tags have been added? How is it in the curriculum? What grade is it being used for? Is someone above grade or below grade, right? Um, who is the audience? What is the instructional setting, right? Are you in a refugee camp? Are you an elite suburb? Are you in, you know one of those little like schools in India, that's just a computer sitting in the middle of the village where the kids are supposed to poke the buttons. Like where, what is the context? That's all part of the paradata. And what is the experience level of the class and the teacher? And so I would say um, that's important for all the homeschool people because what's coming next is entrepreneurship. And so, and, and Gates has been funding that for forever. Teacher entrepreneurs, right? And isn't there some online platform teachers, 
teachers teach teachers or something like shared resources. Like you can make materials and put them online and people can pay you for them. Um, the teacher entrepreneur is what they want because guess what? You're the vertical too, right? They want to know like how much did you move someone and you put a metadata tag on you, you put like a tag on something and it stays there. That's what the soul bound tokens are. Right. And so you tag someone that you were their tutor you were their personal tutor or you were their VIP kid teacher. Or I used to work at a botanic garden, right? And we had homeschool programs. We hosted them. And I used to speak to my colleague who ran the programs. And I said, you know, they're going to they're going to totally love us because we are um, we're in a, a neighborhood that is in the middle of like a lot of environmental devastation. It's a low income community. It's under resourced. There's environmental racism. Like we're pretty progressive. We try to make it accessible to the community. They're going to want to come in and figure out and get all the data from our homeschooling programs, like our stuff that's really cool and creative. And guess what? Then my colleagues who are delivering those programs, they're going to have a data tag and all the kids coming are going to have data tags. And so even the people you might think like, oh, I've left the school system because it's terrible and I had to leave. And now I'm doing this other thing, this other creative opportunity. Well, yeah, because that's the way it's set up. It's set up for you to go leave and then eventually they'll give the vouchers and then you'll have your your ID number, your digital ID number, and it'll all be synced up and they'll say, okay, well, when you've, you've taught at the online pop-up, well, this is pop-up preschool, pop-up preschool in the park, Tinker Garden. That's one of the things I talked about with Leo, Tinker Garden. Who would have ever thought that you would have pop-up Uber preschool in the parks with random moms? And I'm not saying like moms aren't qualified to do the work, but you, you're just going to like show up and drop your kid off with someone you don't know in the park like that, like a toddler. That's weird. Like we, nobody would do that except for now. Like we can imagine that you've got these new scenarios where, you know, randomly kids are being shut out of school and sent home and people have to work. And like, eventually you're going to have these pop-up preschools, right? And then the, 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 the mom or the dad, who's the individual entrepreneur of the Tinker Garden franchise in the so-and-so local park, you know, they're going to have these tokens that they're giving to the kids for the, you know, completing the activities. And, you know, it's someday the kid's going to be 45 in the haptic suit driving it. And like, you're going to either get credit or not credit on how good they are based on like the quest you did in the park 30 years ago, because there's a permanent record and it's insane. So I just wish we could like all, this is Tinker Garden, T-I-N-K-E-R. So this was someone who was actually connected to Newton. And I would say like, go back and, and, and look at, at, the stuff that Leo and I did with the interspecies currency. Like, it's ridiculous that we're even saying it, but like, I have to say it. And, it, uh, you know, my, it, the, the stuff I'm saying is happening. So, okay, paradata. Um, so the devices in our children's classrooms are largely there because a specific set of government policies have prioritized technology over human educators for the past 15 years. And these devices are watching us as much as we are watching them. And we should be aware that many of the programs in use are direct outgrowths of work done by the Department of Defense in partnership with the private sector and institutions of higher education. Um, shine a light on educational surveillance, ask questions, talk to others and organize about it. <laughs> and like, again, pretty naive in 2017, like where I'm going, but this was all on point, right? And, and I would say um, there were a lot of teachers that went through uh, the stuff called VAM, value added modeling, where they would talk about growing students as data and, you know, which teachers grew the students the most. And it was always kind of crazy because my kid attended a magnet public school and those kids were there because it was a magnet school. There's a pretty high bar. So when you were testing them, they rarely showed a lot of growth on a dashboard because they were functioning at a pretty high level already. And so, you know, they would have to come up with ways of like messing things up to show growth because like it wasn't actually measuring anything that was authentically intellectual. It was just a data dashboard point. And that's what we're turning people into these dashboard points that will eventually be put into constellations of um, these Veroni uh, tessellations. Um, so, so, but the value added model people, teachers kept saying, well, I don't want this. Like I didn't get into education. Um, for extra money. Cause like, if you got a good score, then you would, they would give you some, throw some, some extra money your way. They're like, we don't want that. We actually just want a good wage that respects the, our work and what we do. 
and to, so that we can care for our families. And we don't want this extra money because nobody goes into it with this idea that we're competitors, like we're competitive teachers. But that's exactly what was happening. Only the trick was that the value added model, which was an agricultural tool, it was an agricultural modeling tool that came out of, um, uh, I know you guys have to go back, you homeschool people. Could you please cut it out for a minute and go back and listen like when I'm done to the beginning. All right. Cause they only could take it to a certain point. I didn't hear any of these people talking about the stuff that's going on. They're totally about all the libertarians and everything, the conservatives and whatever, get out of school and go back. So you can be the learning agent. And we can sit on your shoulder and learn all about you. They want that. I'm just saying, okay. <laughs> like, so go back and listen, like, cause you, this is an important lesson that people need to get. Um, so the value added modeling came out of Tennessee and uh, University of Tennessee, and that's Oak Ridge National Lab. So again, that's the metabolic uh, radioactive isotope track and tracing. And um, so the value added model was always going to be for the computer programs. Like eventually there were not going to be teachers. It was going to be just the computers. So, um, so anyway, so I'm going to read a little bit. If you don't like my reading, you can like absent now. I had various people critiquing my choices of reading, which blah. I would say like, for all y'all out there commenting, I would invite you to consider offering two affirmative comments for every negative comment. <laughs> and if you don't like what I'm reading, you don't have to listen. But this, my friend Deep D, uh, who's in, in India, it's, it's the Gita, uh, had said that she thought I would get something out of it. So I'm reading it together, bits and pieces. And then I'm, I, I think I'm going to give up on feed because I don't think it's really good as a read aloud, but I am going to read a section from the diamond age about the Turing machine and blockchain. So I'm going to do chapter one of the, the, the Gita first. So Arjuna's dilemma. So, and again, deep is always telling me the thing is, is that we need the next right thing. You have the only, you need to do the next right thing. So I think this is part of it. The blind. So Arjuna's dilemma. The blind king inquired from his charioteer, Oh, Sanjaya, tell me in detail, what did my sons and the Pandava, Pan, Pandavas do on the battlefield before the war started? And this is chapter summary. Uh, Sanjaya said, Arjuna asked his charioteer friend, Lord Krishna, to drive his chariot between the two armies so that he could see the armies on both sides. Arjuna felt great compassion to see his friends and relatives on the opposite side, whom he must kill to win this war. He became confused, spoke of the evils of war, and refused to fight or do his duty as a warrior. Arjuna sat down on the back seat of the chariot with his mind overwhelmed with sorrow. Uh, chapter 2, Spiritual Knowledge. Sanjaya said, Lord Krishna spoke these words to Arjuna, whose eyes were tearful and downcast, and who was overwhelmed with compassion and despair. O oh, Lord Krishna, as if smiling, spoke these words to distressed Arjuna in the midst of the two armies. And then it says, the teachings of the Gita begin. Uh, important verses are highlighted. <laughs> okay. All right. So let's see. So the Supreme Lord said, you grieve for those who are not worthy of grief and yet speak words of wisdom. The wise grieve neither for the living nor the dead. There was never a time when these monarchs, you or I, did not exist, nor shall we ever cease to exist in the future. Just as a living being acquires a childhood body, a youth body, and an old age body during this life, similarly it acquires another new body after death. The wise are not deluded by this. The contacts of the senses with the sense objects gives rise to the feelings of heat and cold and pain and pleasure. They are transitory and impermanent, and therefore learn to endure them. O oh, Arjuna, because a calm person who is not afflicted by these sense objects and is steady in pain and pleasure becomes fit for immortality. So it says, the spirit is eternal, the body is transitory. The invisible spirit is eternal and, <laughs> and the visible world, including the physical body, is transitory. The reality of these two is indeed certainly seen by the seers of the truth. The spirit by which all this universe is pervaded is indestructible. No one can destroy the imperishable spirit. Bodies of the eternal, immutable, and incomprehensible spirit are perishable. Therefore, fight, O Arjuna. One who thinks that spirit is a slayer and one who thinks spirit is slain are both ignorant, because spirit is neither slays nor is slain. 
The spirit is neither born nor does it die at any time. It does not come into being or cease to exist. It is unborn, eternal, permanent, and primeval. The spirit is not destroyed when the body is destroyed. O oh, Arjuna, how can a person who knows that the spirit is indestructible, eternal, unborn, and immutable, kill anyone or cause anyone to be killed? So, and that's death and reincarnation of the soul. Just as a person puts on new garments after discarding the old ones, similarly, the living entity acquires new bodies after casting away the old bodies. Weapons do not cut the spirit. Fire does not burn it. Water does not make it wet. And the wind does not make it dry. Spirit cannot be cut, burned, wet, or dried. It is eternal, all-pervading, unchanging, immovable, and primeval. The spirit is said to be unexplainable, incomprehensible, and unchanging. Knowing the spirit as such, you should not grieve. Even if you think that this living being takes birth and dies perpetually, even then, O Arjuna, you should not grieve like this, because death is certain for one who is born, and birth is certain for one who dies, and the cycle of birth, death continues. And therefore, you should not lament over the inevitable. All beings, O Arjuna, are unmanifest, invisible to our physical eyes, before birth and after death. They manifest between the birth and the death only. What is there to grieve about? Some... Look upon the spirit as a wonder. Another describes it as wonderful and others hear of it as a wonder. And even after hearing about it, very few people know it. Oh, Arjuna, the spirit that dwells in the body of all beings is eternally indestructible. Therefore, you should not mourn for anyone. Considering also your duty as a warrior, you should not waver because there is nothing more auspicious than for a warrior than a righteous war. Only the fortunate warriors, O oh, Arjuna, get such an opportunity for a righteous war against evil that is like an open door to heaven. Wow. So, okay. So this is the commentary that went along with it. All right. The righteous war is not a religious war against the followers of other religions. The righteous war may be waged even against our own evildoer, kith and kin, Rig Veda. <laughs> Life is a continuous battle between the forces of evil and goodness whosoever kills an innocent human being, it shall be regarded as if he has killed the entire humanity. It is better to die for a right cause and acquire the grace of sacrifice than to die an ordinary but compulsory death. The gates of heaven open wide for those who stand up to vindicate justice and righteousness, dharma. Not to oppose an evil is to indirectly support it. Very similar ideas are expressed in other scriptures of the world. The Bible says, happy are those who suffer persecution because they do what God requires. The kingdom of heaven belongs to them, Matthew 5.10. There is no sin in killing an aggressor. Whosoever helps and supports an aggressor is also an aggressor. And thus, all those who supported uh, Quaravas were basically aggressors and deserve to be eliminated. If you will not fight this righteous war, then you will fail in your duty, lose your reputation, and incur sin. People will talk about your disgrace forever. <laughs> to the honored, dishonor is worse than death. The great warriors will think that you have retreated from the battle out of fear. Those who have greatly esteemed you will lose respect for you. Your enemies will speak many unmentionable words and scorn your ability. What could be more painful to you than this? You will go to heaven if killed in the line of duty, or you will enjoy the kingdom on earth if victorious, and therefore get up with the determination to fight, O Arjuna. Treating pleasure and pain, gain and loss, and victory and defeat alike, engage yourself in your duty. By doing your duty this way, you will not incur sin. <coughs> Im <coughs> Sorry. Im Importance of karma yoga, the selfless action. The wisdom of spiritual knowledge has been imparted to you, O Arjuna, and now listen to the wisdom of karma yoga, the selfless service, seva, endowed with which you will free yourself from the bondage of, or reactions of actions, karma. In karma yoga, no effort is ever lost and there is no adverse effect. Even a little practice of this discipline protects one from the great fear of birth and death. A karma yogi has a resolute determina determination for God realization. O oh, Arjuna, but the desires of one who works to enjoy the fruits of work are endless material and spiritual aspects of life. The misguided ones who delight in the melodious chanting of the Vedas or any scripture without understanding its real purpose, 
Think, O Arjuna, as if there is nothing else in it except the rituals for the sole purpose of obtaining heavenly enjoyment. They are dominated by material desires and consider the attainment of heaven as the highest goal of life. They engage in specific rites for the sake of prosperity and enjoyment. Rebirth is the result of their action. The resolute determination of self-realization is not formed in the minds of those who are attached to pleasure and power and whose judgment is obscured by such realistic ritualistic activities. A portion of the Vedas deals with the three modes or states of the material nature. Become free from pairs of opposites. Be ever balanced and unconcerned with the thoughts of acquisition and preservation. Rise above the three states and be self-conscious, O Arjuna. To a self-realized person, scriptures are as useful as a small, small reservoir of water when the water of a huge lake becomes available. Theory and practice of karma yoga. You have control over your respective duty only, but no control or claim over the results. The fruits of work should not be your only motive, and you should never be inactive. Do your duty to the best of your ability, O Arjuna, with your mind attached to the Lord, abandoning worry and attachment to the results, and remaining calm in both success and failure. The calmness of mind is called karma yoga. Work done with selfish motives is inferior to far less selfless service or karma yoga, and therefore be a karma yogi, O Arjuna. Those who work only to enjoy the fruits of their labor are in truth unhappy because one has no control over the results. A true karma yogi becomes free from both vice and virtue in this very life, and therefore strive for karma yoga, working to the best of one's abilities without becoming attached to the fruits of work is called karma yoga. Wise karma yogis are freed from the bondage of rebirth by renouncing attachments to the fruits of all work and attain a blissful divine state. When your intellect completely pierces the veil of confusion, then you will become indifferent to what has been heard and what is to be heard from the scriptures. Let me see how long this goes on. Okay. So this is, okay. When your intellect that is confused by the conflicting opinions and the ritualistic doctrine of the Vedas shall stay steady and firm on concentrating on the Supreme Being, and then you shall attain union with the Supreme Being in trance. Arjuna said, O Krishna, what are the marks of an enlightened person whose intellect is steady? How does a person of steady intellect speak? How does such a person sit and walk? The Supreme Lord says, when one is completely free from all the desires of the mind and satisfied with the eternal being, God, by the joy of the eternal being, and then one is called an enlightened person, O Arjuna, a person whose mind is unperturbed by sorrow, who does not crave pleasures, and who is completely free from attachment, fear, and anger, is called a sage of steady mind. Those who are not attached to anything, who are neither elated by getting desired results, nor troubled by undesired results, their intellect is considered steady. When one can completely withdraw the senses from its sense objects, as a tortoise withdraws its limbs into the shell for protection from dangers, then the intellect of such a person is considered steady. The desire for sensual pleasures fades away if one abstains from sense enjoyment, but the craving for sense enjoyment remains. The craving also disappears from one who has known the supreme being. The dangers of unrestrained sen senses. Re re restless senses, O Arjuna, forcibly carry away the mind of even a wise person striving for perfection. One should fix one's mind on me with loving contemplation after bringing the senses under control. One's intellect becomes steady when one's senses are under complete control. One develops attachment to sense objects by thinking about sense objects. Desire for sense objects comes from attachment to sense objects, and anger comes from unfulfilled desires. Delusion or wild ideas arise from anger. The mind is a bewildered de by delusion. Reasoning is destroyed when the mind is bewildered. One falls from the right path when reasoning is destroyed. And I think we can imagine like how, how all of the social media world is feeding into this destruction, this delusion that makes, that inflames everybody's senses and desires and makes everybody unstable. Peace through sense control and self-knowledge. A disciplined person enjoying sense objects with senses that are under control and free from likes and dislikes attains tranquility. All sorrows are destroyed upon attainment of tranquility. The intellect of such a tranquil person soon becomes completely steady and united with the source. 
There is neither self-knowledge nor self-perception to those who are not united with the eternal being. Without self-perception, there is no peace. And without peace, there can be no happiness. Just a little bit more on chapter two, and then I'll do the next one. The mind, when controlled by roving senses, steals away the intellect as a storm takes away a boat to the sea from its destination, the spiritual shore. Therefore, O Arjuna, once intellect becomes steady, when the senses are completely withdrawn from its sense objects. A yogi, the person of self-restraint, remains wakeful when it is night for all others. It is night for a yogi who sees when all others are wakeful. Note, what is considered real by a yogi is of no value for a worldly person and vice versa. And that's the Maya stuff that I talked about. And actually, Steffers was finding out some stuff about, I think, the Baroni stuff and Maya and the, uh, the grand delusion. And we talked about that with, uh, I think it's NVIDIA. NVIDIA has some programming software that's linked to something called Maya. Or maybe it's Pixar. I think it was Pixar working with NVIDIA. One attains peace when all desires dissipate within the mind without creating any mental disturbance, just as river waters enter the full ocean without creating any disturbance. One who desires material objects is never peaceful. One who abandons all desires and becomes free from longing and the feeling of I and my attains peace. O oh Arjuna, this is the superconscious state of mind. Attaining this state, one is no longer deluded. Gaining this state, even at the end of one's life, a person attains nirvana or becomes one with the absolute. So, so that's interesting. All right. So now I'm just going to read. So essentially the, this book, I, I, I recommend it often. It's, I think, so a few years earlier, Neil Stevenson, he, um, uh, he wrote snow crash, which was essentially where he coined the idea of the metaverse and his parents were, High-level scientists, originally, I think he was born in like the Fort Meade, Maryland area, and he's been working with Magic Leap Virtual Reality. And so he was ahead of the curve on all this stuff. Um, and I'm just going to read a section. In, in the story, essentially, uh, a wealthy hedge fund guy commissions an engineer to create a tablet to train his granddaughter because she feels like the new education system is too rigid. And so he wants to have a system that will educate her in a more creative way. And the engineer is sneaky and he, he makes a copy, he doubles it and then he, for his child because he wants his child to have one too. But along the way it gets stolen uh, in an altercation and it ends up in the hands of a poor girl, which is kind of like one of the, you know, those, uh, you know, many stories start that way, right? And so she ends up with uh, being trained by a woman uh, through an iPad tablet. And she goes on a series of quests uh, to try to essentially her brother, who was part of the theft of the tablet, gets put in jail and she's trying to save him. And so she has to complete these these quests to save her brother. And they get increasingly challenging. And she learns along the way through the tablets and through these sort of games almost. And then this last one is in a castle and it, it involves a touring machine with chains. And I believe that this is blockchain. Um, there's a lot of references to things that sound like blockchain in here. Um, and it's it's with the Duke. And so I'm just going to read a little bit because I think it has a lot to do with this idea of turning uh, the attempt to turn life into code and 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 then the challenges of understanding, navigating a world of code and trying to figure out, discern what's authentic and what is encoded and, and what you can believe and what you can't believe and how you relate to people. And in, in this, she comes upon a castle where a, a, a duke supposedly is locked up and they're communicating through codes with chains. And she's trying to figure out if the duke is, is a person or a computer. So that's the Turing test. And, you know, I, I think we're all sort of working in these um, challenging situations through digital media when we we're trying to figure out what we know of someone and we, we don't have the opportunity to like be with them in person or give them an embrace or feel their energy, like in, 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 in a way that would be immediately apparent, like who, who people are like um, in their nature, not necessarily that they're a robot or not, but just like that direct sort of connectivity at, at, a, at a visceral level that that's being deprived of us. And we're 
thrown into these gamified environments where we're never supposed to be sure about what we know of people online. And um, yeah. So anyway, I will just say too, I just want to chime in because, you know, there's always like this rampant speculation. Oh, who's controlled? They're controlled. Who's like, and if anybody wants to really look and see what I'm up to, like if my story pans out, like just go to the very beginning of my YouTube channel when I have like these little baby clips of me showing up at the school board meetings, like this stuff, these early blog posts, this was my entry point. This was me waking up to the realization that I was in the game. Like, and I, I've been born into the game for goodness sakes, you know, Sesame Workshop is central to this. And that, that would came out the year I was born. Like the world is, is, it is Maya, right? Maybe it is the grand illusion and waking up to different layers of what the illusion was. But, um, you know, I'm sharing these these older blog posts so that you can see nobody's backing me. No one was paying me to go to school board meetings and talk about this. This is based on my really direct personal experience as a mom and figuring things out along the way and being willing to follow the thread, you know, into the labyrinth and, and you know, deeper and deeper into this labyrinth to get to the point that now we're looking at possibly, you know, using track and trace you know, frequencies and oscillators and nanotechnology built off of radioisotope technology to to trace our innermost minds, right? Our consciousnesses into this singularity thing through these very complex mathematical equations and quantum computing. And it's um, so anyway, I just wanted to sort of say that, say that out there is like we're trying to figure out like what's real and what's not real and who's who's a machine and who's not a machine and where they come from, <laughs> because um, yeah, I literally just showed up and said, well, this doesn't seem right. And then it just got worse from there. <laughs> but interesting, right? Because like, that's the thing, the righteous war. And I know, like Cliff would always say, like, it's not a war and probably being like, maybe that's maybe not the best way to pose it, but a, a righteous engagement, a righteous call to action, a righteous opportunity to stand in the breach. Like that's, yeah, that's, that's what we've got. So, okay. So I am going to read from, this is like page 308 of Neil Stevenson's The A Diamond Age. The new territory into which Princess Nell, that's a little girl, had crossed was by far the largest and most complex in all the fairy kingdom in the primer. Paging back to the first panoramic illustration, she counted seven major castles perched on mountaintops and she knew perfectly well that she would have to visit all of them and do something difficult in each one in order to retrieve the 11 keys that had been stolen from her and the one key that remained. She made herself some tea and sandwiches and carried them in a basket to a meadow where she liked to sit among the wildflowers and read. Maybe that's maybe some dandelions, right? Constable Moore's house was a melancholy place without the constable in it, and it had been several weeks since she had seen him. And during the last two years, he had been called away on business with increasing frequency, vanishing, as she supposed, into the interior of China for days and then weeks at a time, coming back depressed and exhausted to find solace in whiskey, which he consumed in surprisingly moderate quantities, but with a fierce concentration, and in midnight bagpipe recitals that woke up everyone in dovetail and a few sensitive sleepers in the new Atlantis, Atlantis clave. During her trip from the campsite of the Mouse Army to the first of the castles, Nell had to use all the wild wilderness skills she had learned in the years of traveling around the land beyond. And she had fought with a mountain lion, avoided a bear, forded streams, lit fires, bit, built shelters. Uh, and by the time Nell had maneuvered Princess Nell to the ancient moss-covered gates of the first castle, the sun was shining horizontally across the meadow and the air was becoming a bit chilly. Nell wrapped herself up in a thermogenic shawl and set the thermostat for something a little on the cool side of comfortable. She had found that her wits become dull if she got too cozy. The basket had a thermos of hot tea with milk and the sandwiches would hold out for a while. The highest of the castle's many towers was surmounted by a great foresailed windmill that turned steadily, even though only a mild breeze could be noticed at Princess Nell's altitude, hundreds of feet below. Set into the, mount, the main gate was a Judas gate, and set into the Judas gate was a small hatch, and below the hatch was a great bronze knocker made in the shape of a letter T, that's maybe like tau, the tau cross, though its shape had become indistinct from an encrustation of moss and lichen. 
Princess Nell operated the knocker only with some effort and given it its decrepit state, did not expect a response. But hardly had the first knock sounded than the hatch opened up and she was confronted by a helmet. But the gatekeeper on the other side was dressed from head to toe in rusty and moss covered suit of battle armor. But the gatekeeper said nothing and simply stared at Princess Nell, or so she assumed, as she could not see his face through the helmet's narrow vision slits. Good afternoon, said Princess Nell. I beg your pardon, but I am a traveler in these parts, and I wonder if you would be so good as to give me a place to stay for the night. Without a word, the gatekeeper slammed the hatch closed, and Nell could hear the creaking and clanking of his armor as he slowly marched away. Some minutes later, she heard him coming toward her again, though this time the noise was redoubled. The rusty locks on the Judas gate grumbled and shrieked, and the gate swung open, and Princess Nell stepped back from, from it as rust flakes, fragments of lichen, and divots of moss showered down around her. Two men in armor now stood there, beckoning her forward. Nell stepped through the gate and into the dark streets of the castle. The gate slammed behind her. An iron vice clamped around each of Princess Nell's upper arms. The men had seized her with their gauntlets. They lifted her into the air and carried her for some minutes through the streets, stairs, and corridors of the castle. They were completely deserted. She did not see so much as a mouse or a rat. No smoke rose from the chimneys. No light came from any window. And in the long hallway leading to the throne room, the torches hung cold and blackened in their sconces. From place to place, Princess Nell saw around another armored soldier standing at attention, but as none of them moved, she did not know whether these were empty suits of armor or real men. Nowhere did she see the usual signs of commerce and human activity, horse manure, orange peels, barking dogs, running sewers. Somewhat to her alarm, she did see an inordinate number of chains. The chains were all of the same somewhat peculiar design and she saw them everywhere piled up in heaps on street corners, overflowing from metal baskets, dangling from rooftops, strung between towers. The clanking and squeaking of the men who bore her along made it difficult for her to hear anything else, but as they proceeded higher and deeper into the castle, she slowly became conscious of a deep, grinding, growling noise that pervaded the very ashlers. The noise crescendoed as they hustled down the long final hallway and became nearly earth-shaking as they finally entered the vaulted throne room at the very heart of the castle. The room was dark and cold, though some light was admitted by clear story windows high up in the vaults. The walls were lined with men in armor, standing stock still, sitting in the middle of the room on a throne twice as high as a man was giant, dressed in a suit of armor that gleamed like a looking glass. Standing below him was a man in armor holding a rag and a wire brush, vigorously buffing one of the Lord's, Lord's greaves. Welcome to Classel Touring, said the Lord in a metallic voice. And by the time Princess Nell's eyes had adjusted to the dimness and she could see something else behind the throne, a tremendous shaft as thick as the main mast of a drummond made of a trunk of a great tree bound and reinforced with brass plates and bands. The shaft turned steadily, and Princess Nell realized that it must be transmitting the power of the giant windmill far above them. Enormous gears, black and sticky with grease, were attached to the shaft and transferred its power to other, smaller shafts that ran off horizontally in every direction and disappeared through holes and walls. The turning and grinding of all of these shafts and gears made the omnipresent noise she had noted earlier. One horizontal shaft ran along each wall of the throne room at about the height of a man's chest. This shaft passed through a gearbox at short, regular intervals. A stubby square shaft projected from each gearbox at a right angle, sticking straight out of the wall. These gearboxes tend to coincide with the locations of the soldiers. The soldier who was polishing the Lord's armor worked his way around to one of the Lord's spiked knee protectors and in doing so turned his back on Princess Nell and she was startled to see a large square hole in the middle of his back. Nell knew vaguely what the name Castle Turing was a hint. She'd learned a bit about Turing at Miss Matheson's Academy. It had something to do with computers. She could have turned to the encyclopedia pages and looked it right up, but she had learned to let the primer tell the story in its own way. Clearly, the soldiers were not men in armor, but simply wind-up men, and the same was probably true of the Duke of Turing himself. After a short and not very interesting conversation, during which Princess Nell tried unsuccessfully to establish 
whether the Duke was or was not human, he announced unemotionally that he was throwing her in the dungeon forever. Well, this sort of thing no longer surprised or upset Nell because it had happened hundreds of times during her relationship with the Primer. Besides, she had known from the very first day Harve, her brother, had given her the book and how the story would come out in the end. It was just that the story was anfractious. It developed more ramifications the more closely she read it. One of the soldiers detached himself from his gearbox on the wall, stomped into the corner, and picked up a metal basket filled with one of those peculiar chains. Princess Nell had seen everywhere, and he carried it to the throne, and he fished it through until he found the end, and he fed it into a hole on the side of the throne. In the meantime, a second soldier had detached himself from the wall and taken up a position on the opposite side of the throne. This soldier flipped his visor open to expose some sort of mechanical device in the space where his head ought to have been. A tremendous clattering noise arose from inside the throne. The second soldier caught the end of the chain as it was emerging from his side and fed it into the opening in his visor. A moment later, it popped out of a hatch in his chest, and in this fashion, the entire length of the chain, some 20 or 30 feet in all, was slowly and noisily drawn out of the basket into the noisy mechanism hidden beneath the throne, down the second soldier's throat, out the hatch in his chest, and down to the floor where it gradually accumulated into a greasy heap. The process went on for much longer than Princess Nell first anticipated because the chain frequently changed direction more than once, and when the basket was nearly empty, the chain began to spew it back until ultimately it was nearly full again. But on the whole, it was more apt to go forward than backward, and eventually the last link lifted free from the basket and disappeared into the throne. A few seconds later, the din from the throne stopped, and now Nell could only hear a somewhat lesser chattering from the second soldier. Finally, that stopped as well, and the chain fell from his chest, and the soldier scooped it up in his arms and deposited it in an empty basket that was sitting handily nearby. And then he strode toward Nell, bending forward at the waist, put his, hand, his hard, cold, cold shoulder rather uncomfortably into the pit of her stomach, and picked her right off the floor like a sack of corn. He carried her for some minutes through the castle. Most of the time he spent descending endless stone staircases <coughs> and finally brought her to a very deep, dark, and cold dungeon where he deposited her in a very small, perfectly dark cell. Nell said, Princess Nell used one of the magic spells Purple had taught her to make light. Princess Nell could see the room was about two by three paces. There was a stone bench on one wall to serve as a bed and a hole in the floor for a toilet. A tiny barred window in the back wall led to an air shaft. Evidently, this was quite deep and narrow, and Nell was close enough to the very bottom because no light came through it. The soldier walked out of the cell and pulled the door shut behind him, and as he did, he saw that the lock was extraordinarily large, about the size of an iron bread box mounted to the door, full of clockwork and with a large crank dangling from its center. The door was equipped with a small peephole, and peering out through it, Nell could see that the soldier did not have a key as such. Instead, he took a short length of chain, about as long as his arm, from a peg near the door and fed it into the giant lock, and then he began to turn the crank. And the clockwork clicked, and the chain clanked, and eventually the bolt shot out and engaged the jam, locking Princess Nell into the dungeon. And immediately, the chain crashed out of the lock and landed on the floor, and the soldier picked it up and hung it back on the wall. And then he clanked away and he did not come back until several hours later when he brought her some bread and water, shoving it through a little hatch in the middle of the door, just above the mechanical lock. It did not take Princess Nell long to explore the limited confines of her cell. In one corner, buried under dust and debris, she found something hard and cold and pulled it out for a better look. It was a fragment of chain quite rusty, but clearly recognizable as the same sort of chain she saw all over Castle Turing. The chain was flat. Each link had a toggle, a movable bit of metal in the center, uh, capable of rotating it about and snapping it into place in either two positions, either parallel or perpendicular to the chain. During her first night in the cell, Nell discovered two other things. First, the latch on the little door through which her food was delivered was partly accessible from her side, and with a little effort, she was able to jam it so that she was no, it was no longer locked properly. And after that, she was able to stick her head out of the hatch and examine her surroundings, including the mechanical lock. Or she could reach out with one arm and feel the lock and spin the crank and so on. 
The second discovery came in the middle of the night when she was awakened by a metallic clanking sound coming through the tiny window of the air shaft. Reaching out with one hand, she felt the chain of an, the end of a chain dangling there, and she pulled on it, and after initial resistance, it came free. And in, in short order, she was able to pull up many yards of chain into her cell and pile it on the floor. Now, Nell had a pretty good idea of what to do with the chain, and starting with the end, she examined the toggles and began to mark their positions down in the primer. The primer always gave her scratch pages when she needed them, and she made a horizontal mark for toggles parallel to the chain and a vertical mark for those that were perpendicular and came up with this. Can you see those other lines? If she counted the vertical marks and replaced them with numbers, this amounted to 8, 5, 12, 12, 15, 9, 1, 3, 13, 4, 21, 11, 5, dash, 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 20, 21, 18, 9, 14, 7. And if the numbers stood for letters of the alphabet, horizontal marks divided the letters and doubled the horizontals were spaces. This was, hello, I am Duke Turing. So perhaps the multiple horizontals were codes for commonly used words like the or not used, maybe possibly Alan <laughs> or of. If that was right, then the message was, hello, I am the Duke of Turing, which was interesting since the giant fellow in the armor had previously identified himself as such, and she deemed it unlikely that he would be sending her a message by this route. This must have come from someone out, someone else calling himself the Duke of Turing, perhaps a real living human being. A few years ago, Nell could have relied on it, but in recent years, the primer had become much subtler than it used to be and full of hidden traps, and she could no longer make comfortable and easy assumptions. It was just as likely that this chain had descended straight from the throne room itself and that the mechanical duke was, for some unfathomable reason, trying to dupe her. So while she was happy to respond to this message in kind, she intended to take a guarded approach until she had established whether the sender was human or mechanical. The next part of the message was give blank, 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 chain, blank, 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 tug, blank, 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 answer. Assuming that four horizontal marks stood for Alan and six stood for two, then this was give the chain a tug to answer. And Nell began to flip the toggles on the chain, erase the message from this personage's calling himself the Duke and replaced it with, I am Princess Nell. Why did you imprison me? And then she gave the chain a tug, and after a moment, she began to withdraw from her cell. A few minutes later, back came the message. Welcome, Princess Nell. Let us devise a more efficient means of communication. Which is interesting, because I keep having so many communication problems. <laughs> Followed by instructions on how to use a more compact system of toggles to represent numbers, and how to convert the numbers into letters and punctuation marks. And once this was settled, the Duke said, I am the real Duke. I created these machines and they imprisoned me in a high tower far above you. The machine calling himself the Duke is, is merely the largest and most sophisticated of my creations. And Nell responded, this chain weighs hundreds of pounds. You must be strong for a human. The Duke responded, you are a sharp one, Princess Nell. The full, height of the, the full weight of this chain is actually several thousand pounds and I manage it by means of a winch located in my room and deriving its motive power from the central shaft. Night had long since fallen on the meadow. Nell closed the primer, packed up her basket and returned home. She stayed up late into the night with the primer, just as she had when she was a small child. And the result was she was late for church the next morning. And they said a special prayer for Miss Matheson, who was at home and said to be feeling poorly. And Nell called on her for a few minutes after the service, and then went straight back home and dove into the primer again. She was attacking two problems at once. First, she needed to figure out how the lock on the door worked. And second, she needed to find out whether the person sending her the message was human or mechanical. If she could be confident that he was human, she could ask him for assistance in opening the lock. But until she had settled this issue, she had to keep her activities a secret. The lock only had a few parts she could observe. The crank, the bolt, a pair of brass drums set into the top with digits from zero to nine engraved on them. And so that by spinning different ways, they could display all integers from zero to 99. Uh, these drums were in almost constant state of motion wherever the crank was turning. 
Now, Nell had managed to detach several yards of chain from the one she was using to converse with the Duke. And so she was able to feed different messages into the lock and see what result they had. The number on top changed with every link that went into the machine. And it seemed to determine in a limited way what the machine would do next. For example, she had learned that the number happened to be 09. And if the next link in the chain was in the vertical position, which the Duke referred to as one, the drums would, would spin around and change the number to 23. But if the next link was instead of zero, as the Duke had referred to the links with horizontal toggles, the number of drums would change to 03. But that wasn't all. In this case, the machine would, for some reason, reverse direction in which the chain was moving along the machine and also flick a toggle from zero to one. That is, the machine would write on the chain as well as read from it. And from idle chit-chat with the Duke, <coughs> she learned that the numbers on the drums were referred to as states. Now, at, at first, she didn't know what states led to other states, and so she wandered aimlessly from one state to the next, recording connections on scratch paper. And this soon grew to be a table, listing some 32 different states and how the lock would respond to a one or a zero when it was in, in each of those states. It took a while for Nell to fill out the blank spaces on the table because some of the states were hard to get to. They could be reached only by getting the machine to write a certain series of ones and zeros on the chain. She would have gone crazy with ones and zeros were it not for the frequent interruptions of the Duke, who evidently had nothing better to do than send her messages. These two parallel courses of inquiry occupied all of Nell's free time for a couple of weeks, and she made slow and steady progress. <laughs> you must learn how to operate the lock on your door, the Duke said. This will enable you to effect an escape and come down and rescue me, and I will instruct you. All he wanted to talk about was technology, which wouldn't help Nell in figuring out whether he was human or a machine. Why don't you pick your own lock, she responded, and come rescue me. I'm just a poor, helpless young thing all alone in the world and so scared and lonely, and you seem so brave and heroic. Your story is really quite romantic, and I can't wait to see how it all comes out now that our fates have become intertwined. And the machine placed a special lock on my door, not a touring machine, re responded the Duke. Uh, well, describe yourself, Nell wrote. Nothing special, I'm afraid, wrote the Duke. How about yourself? Slightly taller than average, flashing green eyes, raven hair falling in luxuriant waves to my waist unless I pin it up to emphasize my high cheekbones and full lips, narrow waist, pert breasts, long legs, alabaster skin that flushes vividly when I am passionate about something, which is frequently. Your description is reminiscent of my late wife, God rest her soul. Tell me about your wife. The subject fills me with such unutterable sadness that I cannot bear to write about it. Now let's buckle down and work on the Turing machine. Since the prurient approach had dead-ended, Nell tried a different tack, playing stupid. Sooner or later, the Duke would become a little testy, but he could he was always terribly patient with her, even after the 20th repetition of, could you explain it again with different words? I still don't get it. Of course, for all she knew, he was upstairs punching the wall with his until his knuckles were bloody and simply pretending to be patient with her. A man who had been locked in a tower for years would learn to be extremely patient. She tried sending poetry. He sent back glowing reviews, but declined to send her any of his own, saying it wasn't good enough uh, to be committed to met metal. On her 20th day in the dungeon, Princess Nell finally got the lock open, and rather than making an immediate escape, she locked herself back in and sat down to ponder her next move. If the Duke was human, she could notify him so that they could plan their escape. If he was a machine, Doing so would lead to disaster. She had to figure out the Duke's identity before she made another move, and she sent him another poem. Okay, this is the poem. For the Greeks' love, she gave away her heart, her father, crown, and homeland. They stopped to rest on Naxos, and she woke up alone, uh, alone upon the strand, the sails of her lover's ship descending round the slow curve of the earth. Ariadne fell into a swoon on the churn sand and dreamed of home. Minos did not forgive her and holding diamonds in the pouches of his eyes had her flung into the labyrinth. She was alone this time through a wilderness of blackness wandered Ariadne many days until she tripped on the memory and it was still wound all through the place and she spun it round her fingers, lifted it from the floor, knotted it into lace, erased it. The lace made a gift for him who had imprisoned her. Blind with tears, he read it with his fingers and opened his arms. 
And the answer came back much too quickly. And it was the same answer as always. I do so envy your skill with words. And now if you do not object, let us turn our attention to the inner workings of the Turing machine. She had made it as obvious as she dared and the Duke still hadn't gotten the message. He must be a machine. Why the deception? Clearly the mechanical Duke desired for her to learn about the Turing machine. That is, if a machine could ever be said to desire something, there must be something wrong with the Duke's programming. He knew there was something wrong with it and he needed a human to fix it. Once Nell had figured these things out, the rest of Castle Turing's story resolved itself quickly and neatly. She slipped out of her cell and stealthily explored the castle. The soldiers rarely noticed her, and when they did, they could not improvise. They had to go back to the, du to the Duke to be reprogrammed. And eventually, Princess Nell found her way into a room beneath the windmill that contained a sort of clutch mechanism. And by disengaging the clutch, she was able to stop the shaft. And within a few hours, the springs inside the soldier's back had all run down and they had all stopped in their tracks and the whole castle was frozen as if she had cast an enchantment over it. And now roaming freely, she opened up the Duke's throne and found a touring machine beneath it. And on either side of the machine was a narrow hole descending straight through the floor and into the earth as far as her torchlight could illuminate. And the chain contained the Duke's program dangled on either side of the hole. Nell tried throwing stones into the holes and never heard them hit the bottom. The chain must be unfathomably long. High up in one of the castle towers, Princess Nell found a skeleton in a chair, slumped over a table piled high with books. Mice, bugs, and birds had nibbled away all of the flesh, but traces of gray hair and whiskers were still scattered around the table. And around the cervical vertebrae, there was a golden chain bearing a seal with the T insignia. And I think that's the Tau Cross. All right, T-Mobile guys, right? Magenta. Uh, she spent some time going through the Duke's books. Most of them were notebooks where he would sketch the inventions he hadn't had time to build yet. He'd had plans for whole armies of Turing machines made to run in parallel and for chains with links that could be set in motion uh, in more than two positions and for machines that could read and write on two dimensional sheets of chain and mail instead of one dimensional chains and for a three dimensional Turing grid a mile on a side through which a mobile Turing machine would climb about computing as it went. No matter how complicated his designs became the Duke always found a way to simulate their behavior by putting a sufficiently long chain into one of the traditional Turing machines. That is to say that while the parallel and multidimensional machines worked more quickly than the original model, they didn't really do anything different. So that's, I think that's where I'm going to stop. So she got out of the castle and the touring machines and the chains and the links, and she got that last key. So, um, yeah, so chains and links, um, and trying to simulate reality and planes and tessellations and fractals and betting and risk profiling and all of it runs on data. And I think these badges and tags and our interactions are the chains in the chain link blockchain simulations that they're going to build to create these fake neural networks to try to mirror reality. And so yeah, I guess, I guess we're at two hours. So thanks for hanging out with me um, today. And I hope you will try to explain to people advanced distributed learning <laughs> and, um, and the metadata tags and that doing all of this. They'd actually love to have all of this done in your houses and give you a blockchain voucher so that you can be taught at home so they can spy on you and your family in your house. Um, and eventually it will just be wearable with technology. And remember, Mr. Whatever, Dan Novi at MIT, Synthetic Programmable Hallucinations, right? They don't even maybe need a primary. You'll just, they'll just like put it in. Um, so uh, yeah, so I knew I was onto something in 2017 and it involved Empire and involved gaming and it involves us waking up to the game. And I, I think so someone early on had asked about that the solution and like there's different ways of going about this. I would say large numbers of people are like, this is a righteous war and we need every battalion and we need to sort of, you know, make concessions and Lord, like water down our outlook so that we can all unify against this unified battle of the thing. But I think in doing that in the watering down and the losing your core, you you lose it all. So another way of doing it, and I, I mentioned this is with 
my friend Steffers, we were talking about the labyrinth and walking the labyrinth to the middle with the string. And that's, you know, the, it's very interesting that that poem there in the, in the Stevenson book was Ariadne and, and Minos and, um, the idea of walking to the middle, this idea of like, and not everybody can walk the labyrinth, right? I mean, a labyrinth would get clogged up if you had battalions of armies trying to walk a narrow labyrinth. So sometimes maybe it's just a few of us that can walk the labyrinth. And maybe maybe when we get to the middle, we'll find the the thing. But when she said that they found the clutch of the, the windmill, like the center shaft, you know, the wrench in the gears, right? Like I'm, that's, that's what I picked, you know, was wrench in the gears. And so, yeah, can we find the shaft? Uh, that's running this abomination and, and uh, release the clutch. And then maybe within that, it'll, it'll slow down. Um, so anyway, thoughts for the day have, you know, if you're getting a long weekend, uh, enjoy the long weekend and um, till next time.